Good afternoon. Welcome. My name is Erica Walker. I am the Senior Assistant Dean for Instruction here at the Haas School of Business, and I'd like to welcome you on behalf of Dean Ann Harrison, who's traveling today to our Dean Speaker Series. I'm excited for this particular topic today. Um, it's just really wonderful to be here on this occasion to reflect on just how much change Alex and his Changemaker class have catalyzed both on campus and in the lives of students. I remember when Alex was in the process of developing this course. I remember he was really thoughtful and serious about how to ensure that he would be able to inspire students to be change makers. And not after they patented a new invention, not after they secured a new job title that was high profile, or not after they started a new company, but right now as immediate change makers, right? I was excited that we were gonna be able to offer something like this in the undergraduate program. Now, Alex began teaching this class in 2019, drawing rave reviews from students in the very first semester. Students would share that the Becoming a Changemaker class was life-changing and even transformational. They were surprised that such a course as this was actually offered as part of business education. And it ultimately reframed the way many students approached their own leadership journey. Now, since that first semester, Alex's Changemaker curriculum has become exceptionally popular all across Haas, among our undergraduates, our MBAs, and even with our Berkeley Executive Education participants. He's found creative ways to teach changemaking at all levels and to all types of learners. Now, students would remark on the inclusive approach that Alex brings to his teaching highlighting how his unique pedagogical approach to change making meets them where they are and specifically inspires them to lead change in brand new ways. He's also pioneered some new approaches to experiential learning, which push our students outside of their comfort zones as they explore what leading change means to them. This is important because it is often during discomfort that we have our most salient growth experiences. Now, as a culture champion, a Haas culture champion, it is especially meaningful to see that this course connects incredibly deeply and fundamentally to Haas's defining leadership principles, with one week of class dedicated to exploring the change-making connections to each of those defining leadership principles. And now it's so exciting to see that Alex is making the same magic of his Haas classes available to so many more people through his wonderful new book that was just launched yesterday. <laughs> Haas is featured prominently in the book from chapters named after the Haas defining leadership principles to stories of Berkeley Haas leaders that have um, shown change making, have demonstrated those change making principles in action. Now knowing Alex, I'm sure it was a labor of love to put all of this hard work into writing this book, but he did it because he so deeply believes that every person can be a change maker and he can help everyone fulfill that potential. It's not surprising to anyone that even though this is his book, he wants to use this occasion, this celebration, as a chance to highlight and elevate the work of the impact of the alumni in those classes. So he's joined today by alumni, each an inspiring change maker in their own right. I'd like to take this opportunity to again publicly congratulate you, Alex. This is really exciting. The Haas community is so proud of you and we can't wait to see what this impact will be um, to, on all change makers out there everywhere. Um, so I'm going to now turn this over to Alex who will lead the panel discussion today. Again, congratulations and let's give another warm round of applause. Thank you so much, Erica. Super kind introduction and I'm just so grateful to be here today with all of you. Um, of course, my name is on the cover of the book, but it's a community effort, and it's such a joy to celebrate this book in community with all of you. As Erica mentioned, this book is very Haas, it, and it all started with a single serendipitous conversation. So I went to meet with Jay Stowski, who is our Senior Assistant Dean of Instruction. I know Jay's watching virtually. Um, I was going to him for advice on a career transition, but I think he could tell that my heart wasn't really in it. And so I will always remember what he said. He said, but Alex, what do you really want to do? I said, well, you know, what I really want to do is teach and then made some excuses for why I couldn't possibly teach. But to my shock and delight, 
he said, all right, what do you want to teach? And in that moment became crystal clear. I said, I want to teach becoming a change maker. And again, to my shock and delight, he said, okay, put together a syllabus, show it to me, and we'll go from there. And I remember literally leaping out of my seat, so elated that someone else saw this potential in this class and this vision. And I shook his hand, I closed the door to his office, immediately pulled out my phone and Googled how to create a syllabus because I had no idea how to do it. But that started this journey, which is now so special to bring all full circle here to Haas. Um, as Erica mentioned, I don't want this to be about me. I so believe in a potential of all of us to become change makers. And I want to use this as a platform to lift up the stories and the impact of so many other change makers. And here's the amazing thing is I could have chosen any of the hundreds of students I've had the privilege and joy of teaching to be up here. Uh, but I'm so thrilled to be joined by three alumni today. So we'll have a panel discussion about leading change, about positive change, about being a change maker. And I thought to get us started, we'd have each of them just briefly introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about their change maker journey and their impact. So Angelica, we start with you. Yeah, hi. Just intro and what we've been up to. Kind and of? What, yeah. what makes you a change maker? Okay, yeah. okay. Hi, I'm Angelica. I graduated from Haas in May 2021. I came back to Walk. And I'm currently a Google APMM, so I work in product marketing there. But during my five to nine, I'm also a content creator, so I make content online really about, which segues me to my next point of my change making, is um, ungatekeeping the process of whether it's college, career, new grad life. I feel like like that was something I experienced when I got to Berkeley or coming to a competitive school. There's a lot of just the whole process in starting from the college admission process was a lot of, you know, you got to know this or these are the secrets and very this gatekeeping energy that I just personally did not you know, resonate with and I don't believe in and I really believe that there's enough room and success and opportunities for everyone. So I started making my content and having these like micro change making moments, which is an element in the book that is talked about and really bringing that to scale on the internet. I started making TikToks and Instagram and YouTube about my experience and the ways I want to just spread this wealth of knowledge of like, hey, recruiting for certain positions start in this time. And like so many people across the country who go to a wide variety of schools just don't know about these things. And I just wanted to share with people what my experiences are. And I had the advantage of going to such a great school like Haas that had these resources in the community and the knowledge that they gave me. I was like, I need to be telling everybody and not just me and my four friends here. So that's kind of a little bit insight of what I've been doing with my life and my change making um, habits. <laughs> And a number of my students have said they specifically chose Berkeley and chose Haas because of the videos that they've watched of you. So you're an amazing recruiter for us. Yeah, thank you. Alicia. Hi, I'm Alicia. I'm actually a fifth year still studying here, a uh, business and economics major. Um, and I guess my change making journey started in 2020. Um, I'm a swimmer as well. And the Olympics had been postponed and I'd kind of lost my identity a little bit. Like that was everything that I was working towards. And I remember doing my classes and my syllabus, like getting everything ready for the next semester and picking this class. And I didn't consider myself a change maker or anything like that. You know, I'd pretty overwhelmed when I'd get into the Haas classes and everyone would say they're double, triple majors and things like that and how academic Berkeley was. And it wasn't until I took the class that I realized that I could make a change. And it wasn't always just about me and my journey as a swimmer. And so I kind of took the opportunity after the class to get deep into mental health, and particularly with athletes, and try and get on as many podcasts as I could and try and do raffles and bring together that spirit of the Olympics, but also, you know, that the pandemic has been tough and that we can make a change from a very small um, point of view. So I started with myself and just tried to do the local swimming community and get bigger from there um, and then regain my identity in 2021 when the next Olympics came around. So I'm kind of still navigating it, but this class gave me my voice to kind of come out of myself and stop thinking about the I, I guess, and make a change within the wider community. And Shannon, please. Hi there, everyone. My name is Shannon Elliott. I graduated with my MBA in December 2020, which seems like a million years ago at this point, but not that long ago. 
Um, it's funny, Alex, when you were just speaking, I was thinking I had my answer ready about, you know, when I started my change making journey. And I have no idea. Sometimes you just have this memory from long ago just spark out of out of nowhere. I think my first, my very first change maker experience, I think I was eight or nine years old. And I think I was on the playground of my elementary school, and I remember witnessing some kind of confrontation between two of my classmates. And I remember the classmate who had not started it had gotten sent to the principal's office, and I thought that was unacceptable, completely unjust. And I somehow, I don't even think I really knew what a petition was, but I distinctly remember going around and petitioning my classmates and asking them to sign this document in, in support of my friend who was unjustly, you know, unjustly being disciplined. Um, so if that counts as the beginning, maybe that's it. I have no idea what happened. I was nine. I probably did not have the full story, but I chuckle about that because I think there's something, something deep in me from a very early age that, that wanted to fight for justice. But... Um, as an adult, a more informed adult, um, I started my career mostly in nonprofits. Um, my background is in communications. And so for about four years, my first four years of my career, I was working on mental health stigma reduction and social inclusion campaigns actually here in Alameda County um, and working with underserved populations and marginalized groups um, through campaigns, through marketing, things like that, messaging. And then over time, working in a lot of healthcare, mission-based healthcare nonprofits and so forth. And today, after finishing um, my MBA from Haas, I'm working as the director of communications for a fintech company in San Francisco called Lending Club that's really, that's also mission-based, focusing on empowering folks to meet their financial goals. Terrific, thank you. So one of the key themes of becoming a change maker, the book and the class, is this of adaptability and flexibility. So we have one other amazing panelist who was supposed to join us in person, but of course things happen. Uh, and so he was nice enough to film a video for us. So let's also welcome Ibrahim. Building. So I graduated in 2020 um, from the Haas School of Business. Um, and now I'm the CEO and co-founder of Black Book U. We're a diversity, equity, and inclusion solution um, working to streamline peer-to-peer -peer connection for black students the moment that they're thinking of college to when they graduate. A huge inspiration for my education really came from the success of the world of innovation around me. Uh, I was born in Oakland, raised here in the Bay Area, and in seeing a lot of um, you know, the opportunities of Silicon Valley and how they very much overlooked the communities that I came from, I worked to position my education as um, a platform or bridge to the communities that I come from and the opportunities that were all around us, which is why I eventually created Black Book. But a huge, huge, um, you know, stepping stone for me in doing this work really came from adopting the change maker mindset. This notion of um, a growth mindset was something that was new to me, being able to navigate variables, different um, trajectories, different pathways to um, align on your uh, solution or the outcome in the world that you wanna see was something so um, ingrained in myself through this course. But I think what naturally came after that was this idea of learned optimism. There's so many ups, ups and downs as an entrepreneur and being able to be a leader and inspire this cohesive um, path forward is something that will consistently challenge you not only as an entrepreneur, but even outside your work. Um, and lastly, I think that these aspects of mindset really come into play um, in this idea of a collective mindset. For me and for many of us who are reading the book, going through a class, you know, having a conversation with someone, we have an idea of the impact or vision that we want to see in the world. It's not until we're able to articulate this um, and create a shared vision that um, we can start to work towards the outcomes and realities that we want to see. This notion of a shared vision is something that Alex was able to create uh, through his classes and through his community here in Berkeley. And with this book, I believe that there's so much potential in being able to share this to folks who might not have the privilege of sitting in a class or you know, might not have the um, you know, inspiration to kind of um, you know, be a part of things like this. 
Um, it's really a stepping stone that's scratching the surface for many people, um, optimizing access, and really it's a huge milestone. So congratulations to Alex. Um, congratulations to the rest of the community because you know we're all a part of this. And I'm really excited to see what happens next. So thank you all. Peace. Super grateful to Ibrahim for recording that. Um, so what we'll do now is we'll have a little conversation among us on the panel here, and then we'll open up to questions for you about things you want to talk about, change making and beyond. Um, so Shane, I want to pick up on something that you mentioned. Um, one of the greatest joys for me as an educator is this like magical moment where I can literally see someone become a change maker. Sometimes it happens in week one, sometimes it's week 14, hopefully by RRR week at least, but sometimes it's by the end of the class where they realize, oh, I can become a change maker. And that's magical as an instructor to get to be part of that. It's a privilege to be part of that. So we can start with Alicia and then Angelica. I'd love to hear from you. What's the moment where you first realized that you could be a change maker? Alicia, we can start with you. You want me? In the class that I'm... In your life or in the class, yes? Um, honestly, I'd say in the class, it was when you were talking about the kind of growth mindset and the, versus the fixed fixed mindset and then applying that to the end of a uh, semester project my group and I decided we were going to do something to get active you know we were taking the class from our bedrooms online um, and so it was how to mobilize the community uh, from a mental health perspective and get everybody moving and to create that plan and I wanted to see that through um, particularly in the UK where lockdown was really hard and I guess that's where it kind of clicked like I don't have to just stay here and be stagnant and not do anything. I can start from a very small perspective and go to my local club and try and implement implement the change making process that we had talked about. And, you know, I didn't really view myself as a change maker or anything like that. I just viewed myself as one of the Berkeley students taking your class um, until I managed to go home in 2021 for the first time and do that and implement that kind of growth mindset with the pro project that we did there. Um, yeah. Okay. I think for me, um, the idea of micro leadership was, I guess, put into words from your class. But going back to the, my thing about I think growth mindset is one thing, but also abundance mindset is something that I learned that was so important to my journey, especially being at Haas, it's a competitive program, it's a competitive school. I think sometimes we get a reputation for, you know, there's only so many spots for this job or like a lot of sometimes the students, unfortunately, were almost pitted against each other. And I really always, even among my friend group, thought that there was enough opportunities, enough jobs, enough money for all of us. And it really is one of those like, what is it? A tide raises all... I'm going to butcher this phrase. So I think all, all votes. votes. Yes, all votes, yeah. yes. And so I, you know, started with obviously how I treat my friends with this type of thing of like career mobility was like something I was really passionate about and helping my friends feeling empowered and resumes and all that stuff. And then taking that to the next level, like practicing those micro leadership moments that Alex talked about and then bringing that onto the internet. And I felt that there was also a gap in the market for someone who's a new grad, who's talking about their honest experience and someone who isn't 20 years out of their career, but someone who can really people gate kept where they went to get tutoring or SAT prep because it was that competitive. And so I was like, I want to take this knowledge and share it with people and get people to also adopt that mindset when it comes to any career or even life. Like there is so much out there for everybody and it's not a finite number of opportunities and people and jobs and money and all that stuff so even being a content creator or influencer that mindset could be there in that community too of like well there's only this many events or this many brand deals or sponsorships but that's something that I just took on as a micro thing in my life and I wanted to really share that across all my uh, different touch points. So that's something I'm really passionate about is like practicing in small moments and then finding ways you can amplify that. 
Thanks. And Shannon, you, of course, talked about your earliest age uh, on the playground, but how My about... My nine-year-old like self-excluded. Yeah. Um, I think I really realized I could be a change maker when I had that aha moment where I redefined fundamentally what change making was, right? I was always, and probably a lot of us, right, uh, think of change making as big and bold and flashy and, you know, this 20-year-old wonderkind who found the next huge, you know, multi-billion dollar startup, right? I did not see myself in, in that sort of... Um, image and also I can be, while I can be extroverted, I also very much have an introverted side. So I'm not always out there hustling, going to cocktails, trading business cards. I have my quiet moments too. But I think what was so great about this class is so much of what I'd already been doing, I hadn't seen it as change making, but really it was. It was those smaller moments, those quieter moments. And even if you aren't necessarily leading this big, bold initiative from scratch, if you even simply create a safe space for others to share ideas and connect that might not have otherwise been there had you not done it, that's huge. That's moving things forward. So I think as I progressed in my career, right, right out of undergrad, I had this big all or nothing black or white thinking of what change making was. But as I progressed through my career, um, seeing those smaller moments, quieter moments, how can I open up doors for other people to, and support them in change? It just comes in so many forms. So if you're ever struggling with that, wondering if you're making a difference, um, you most likely are. Take a breath, go for a walk, zoom out your perspective a little bit, and um, I'm, I'm pretty sure you're on the right track. Yeah, so appreciate that. In the book, of course, I define change making, and I define it in a radically inclusive way. Um, it's simply someone who leads positive change from where they are, and that makes it inclusive to all of us to be change makers. We don't need a formal title or role or responsibility. All it takes is giving ourselves the authority to step up and say, yes, I can do something about this in a way that's true to who we are, introvert or extrovert or beyond. And I think building on that, you know, if we're at Berkeley, we're all pro probably already very achievement oriented individuals, right? And I think to just get those little wins, it gives you that confidence that you're making progress to keep going, right? If your bar is all or nothing and it's so high and you don't feel like you're ever reaching it, it can be really easy to be disheartened and kind of walk away and give up when in reality, you know, you've actually come already so far. So just, just keep going. Um, I think you wrote, I'm going to misattribute this quote, action is the antidote to despair, right? Was that... That's not me. That's Joan Baez that said that. But I yeah, I don't want to take credit for that. But. <laughs> I was going to say Joni Mitchell, but I was yeah. going to mess it up. Yeah. Um, so again, those small, and again, that took me time to realize. I would not have, you know, 10 years ago would I have had this perspective? No. But um, just keeping that in mind, yeah, it gets you through the harder times. Yeah. So appreciate that. So of course, the subtitle of the book is An Actionable Inclusive Guide to Leading Positive Change at Any Level. We've spoken a bit on the inclusivity lens. I want to talk a bit about the action-oriented lens. And so I'd love to hear from you. What's a lesson from the class that you sort of put into practice or that you want to teach the community when it comes to change making? Start with anyone who feels called to get started. I could share this story that we talked about earlier. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. Coincidentally happened to me. Um, about, gosh, what was that, six months or so ago, maybe longer, um, and, and it was it was kind of a, it was a, a, t it was a tough moment, it, it turned out okay, but this was actually just a moment in life that presented itself to me. I was not planning for it, I was out in the world, it was not related to work in any way, but I think this is a great example of micro-leadership with re very real human consequences. So I was out in Oakland doing some grocery shopping, you know, at a standard shopping center in a Trader Joe's parking lot. And I was going up to my car on the second floor. I had just left a coffee meeting with one of my colleagues in a, in a pretty good mood. It was Friday. I was ready for the weekend. And I noticed a woman who appeared. She was lying on the ground, and she seemed to be struggling a little bit. And I was confused. And I immediately I looked around to see if anyone else was doing anything. And I started to question myself because my eyes told me one thing. But I looked around, and I was like, well, no one else is helping her, so she must be OK. And then I actually saw an individual come over. Um, she was in the process of being robbed, but maybe no one else had seen it or, um, or just didn't take action. And someone came over and actually kicked her in the stomach. And immediately, I just, I just went into reaction mode and partly panic, but partly I just had to do something. And um, it was fascinating because in real time, we were seeing I, as the first person to react, suddenly maybe three or four people around me, because they saw me acting, then they came in to help too. And so Alex talks about that idea in a less dramatic way, but in his book about it's very often that first person, that first agent of change to get others to go on board, right? Whether it's something like an emergency like that or even a smaller change initiative at your company or in life, 
that first person is that catalyst to get other people on board, and it makes it makes all the difference in the world. And thankfully, she ended up being okay. It has a happy ending. She's doing well. But um, yeah, it's just you. It's so easy to. I think when you're studying this stuff, put it in very like theoretical context and read, in case, read case studies. It's so applicable to absolutely everything in life when you're least expecting it. Thanks, I so appreciate that. Yeah, Alicia? I think for me, the first action item that came um, was actually in January. So I finished the class in December and in January, the pandemic was obviously still going on and one of my close friends had sadly um, been impacted through his deteriorating mental health. Um, so kind of in his honor, I wanted to swim for something bigger than myself. And I began training, refocused myself. And by the time the Olympics came around, it was kind of like, oh, this is cool. Like I can put on the like Team GB jerseys and things like that. But it wasn't the feeling that I had thought it was going to be. And I kind of took the t-shirt off and plucked up the courage to ask some of my teammates to sign it. And, you know, like a lot of the people I idolized, I asked for their signatures on this top and I didn't wear it again. I got it framed and I decided to do a global raffle um, to raffle it off in Max's honor. And I think that was the first solidified action that I took. It was pretty hard because it's so emotional but also these were people I looked up to so I didn't feel like a change maker in myself in that I was you know asking people way above me but I think that when the raffle was done and it actually went to a little girl um who knew the um person that it was in honor of that made me realize that it had created a change and you know obviously it created like a couple thousand dollars that went to this charity but this little girl, I still email, I keep in contact with her. Um, she sends me cards at competitions, but to know that she's inspired to make a change at eight years old um, was the thing that made it all worth it to me, you know, that I didn't see myself like that, but it's created a change for someone that young. And that is down to the lessons I learned from this class. So, yeah. I love that. I'm no longer mad I didn't win the raffle. I think she's deserving more than I am. Angelica, how about you? Thank you. I think for me, one of the hard to swallow pills that was really helpful with both the book and the class was really being honest with yourself. And I know there's a section of your book when you talk about like, you felt important just because people were asking you questions of like, oh, can you check my work? Or like, it's this idea of like, are you really making impact? And are you really saying what you're saying? Or are we like pretending that we are because everything is lined up and we're, you know, basically playing dress up for leader, right? Or change maker. And even this whole thing of like something I'm really passionate about, like I've talked about is um, on gatekeeping, like so many things about, especially about like success or whatever that means for different people. But taking a really, like I wasn't always like this and I definitely have my fair share of like insecurities where I feel like that's where a lot of those feelings come from. And being really honest was a big thing. I know you talked about in your class and the book was like checking yourself of like, okay, like, why am I feeling this way? Why am I frustrated? Why don't I want to share my resume tips with my friends? Like like thinking about like really walking through that process of, and getting honest with myself was such a big wake up call for me. And as soon as I find, found that that was the root of why so many people are gatekeepers and so many people don't like to share resources and networks and whatever, um, helped me like tackle that on my own and be at a better place where I'm like, oh no, I have X, Y, Z things that are going for me. Like feeling much more secure about myself, I think was such a, like a click for me that was able to, why I was able to make content, why it became so much more championing of non-gatekeeping content and uh, empowering others was because I was able to really couple this idea of like, again, abundance mindset, growth mindset, which all came from being very honest with myself. And that was a big thing for me that I took away. Can I add on? Yeah. I totally want to go back to that. You talked about finding your confidence, right? And I think there was another really big moment. There's so many big moments, so many. that Just get the book. There's, they're all filled with big moments. But um, one person you profile in there, we were l lucky enough to have come guest lecture for us, Cal Soon. And she is awesome. I want to be her when I grow up. She is a constant entrepreneur, founder, doing wonderful things in the world. 
And she talked repeatedly. She shared, she's very open with us, shared her struggles of founding companies. I think she said her father had built something up to a million dollars when she was a kid and then lost it all, something like that, and then started from scratch again. And I think a lot of us can identify with the fear of failure, especially working so hard to get to a place like Berkeley and to, you know, whatever you think you need to do for your next career step. And, you know, it, it's, it's scary to take a risk and potentially fail. And here she was completely inspirational talking about all her failures. And I found it fascinating. And I said, didn't the fear of failure ever terrify you? Did it just stop you from even trying? Because sometimes in my past, I would, I would certainly skew that way. And she said... No, in my family, you know, it was just expected. Failure isn't the end. It's a means to an end. You learn through the failure. The failure is an essential part of getting you to where you want to go. If you stopped every time you failed, it would be game over. There'd be nothing else to do or build on, right? So that still sticks, sticks with me to this day. And whenever I'm having an insecure day or insecure moment, I go back to that. And, um, yeah, just trying to internalize, internalize it as much as I can. Thanks. Yeah, so appreciate that. Um, one of the highlights, I think, of the class is bringing in a diverse array of different guest speakers, all who give voice to change making in different roles and sectors. Um, one particularly memorable guest speaker was Sid Espinoza. He's the first ever Latino mayor of Palo Alto, California, and at the time was the head of philanthropy at Microsoft. And so a student asked a question, which I think was a poignant one, which is basically, I want to create big system substantive change, but I also don't want to burn out. Do you have any advice for me? And so Sid started talking, and as he was talking, the sort of instructor, the professor inside of me was like, uh-oh, did he just deflate these students' hopes? But no, he actually gave the most empowering advice, I think, of any of the guest speakers. So he said, we need to stop thinking about leading change, especially systemic change, as the lone person in a race. Instead, start th thinking about it as a relay race, that you will have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years of your career, and think about how you can take the baton from those who came before you, advance it in a really meaningful way, and then when your time comes, find ways to hand that baton off to the next person and do so in a thoughtful way where you're mentoring them, you're supporting them, you're setting them up for success. I always say that change making is a team sport. And I think that's a powerful reframe to think about how we can all be part of change together. So that goes back to one of the themes of Haas, one of the defining leadership principles, which is questioning the status quo. And so my question for each of you is, what's something from the book or from the class that, especially through the lens of leadership and kind of how we make change, that you think, what's the status quo we need to challenge? And what's maybe a tool or an idea from the class that you think can help us question that status quo? I think it's really easy when you are in a bigger organization, um, sometimes you can kind of feel like you're floating along, no one really sees you. You know, if you're in a company of thousands, if not tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people, right? You know, typically the bigger companies are, the more structure, the more, um, the more red tape and bureaucracies there are, right? And it's kind of hard to do your own thing. You can kind of question, am I even making a difference here each day? Am I just coming in, clocking in and out and going home? And am I, is, is, is what I'm doing with my life even, even worth anything at the moment? I think looking for the, again, those quiet moments that we talked about earlier, those really small, how you even show up in meetings, how you show up in settings. Can you um, create psychological safety to, for maybe some of your teammates or your colleagues to speak about an issue they've been struggling with, whereas no one else would give them that space. So it, again, it might not be this big flashy change effort, depending on how you define that or what you envision, but just simply how you show up and relate to others and support others in your day to day can make all the difference. Because you don't know, maybe that person was having a bad day and was about to give up on something and you gave them five minutes and your attention and some encouragement. And then they kept going, and who knows? Maybe they'll, they're will they the ones that find a new medicine for something. You never know, right? You just never know the positive impact your actions can have on someone else. I want to add to that because I feel the same way because I just started my new grad. I'm a year into my first new grad job, and I'm at a very big company. And I think that's a common thing is like you get there with fresh eyes and all these ideas and things you want to do, and there's so many problems, right, especially at big companies. And you could so easily get burnt out trying to, you, do, you can't solve, you know, these big problems and you can't change this company. You can't change even, you know, so, so many things. But as someone who just shows up and being a new grad, I think what I learned was 
the small moments also like setting healthy expectations of like what really is in your power right like again the baton race analogy is so great because you can only do your best for people before you and after you and then the rest of it is kind of like you know well hopefully it'll all start to be in line and there's only so much you can do and analogy that was told to me recently was like you're steering a very very large ship right and you don't want to be at the front of the ship because then you're going to get pummeled but you want to be um directing it and getting allies and getting teamwork to go so it starts to turn into a direction and not into the iceberg so that was a really good thing you brought up because I feel like as a new grad I face that all the time of like I have so many things I want to do and you know feeling frustrated by the the problems are too big I don't have enough power but like what can I do politics yeah well that's what it really it is but (laughs) (laughs) but that's why I think taking small moments and pacing yourself I think is a good way definitely to not face burnout thanks Alicia I think my thing I learned about challenging the status quo uh, in this class was what a leader looks like. I was a captain of the swim team that year, and I thought leadership was this hard, um, kind of competitive person that needed to come down hard on their teammates and needed to be that person that was instructive and not very compassionate and didn't show vulnerability or anything like that. And you know, along with the challenges of that year, but also the class and watching the clips from people like Brene Brown and seeing that, you know, the more you can relate to people and the more compassionate you can be, the more effective you are. And, you know, that first semester, I completely failed as a captain. I was so unrelatable. And watching those clips, hearing from those guest speakers and knowing that it's okay not to be perfect, but also that you are far more relatable if you can be yourself uh, was something that I learned. And I think particularly with the culture that I come from, the status quo of being a leader is this person that you idolize and that doesn't show this emotion. So trying to tap into that was my biggest takeaway from the status quo. I think building on that really quick, I think traditionally in business or maybe like the more old school way of thinking was like, don't show emotions, you know, don't, don't necessarily reach out to people and be warm and fuzzy. Right. I think nowadays, and maybe it's always been this way, but at least in reality, but there's more recognition and openness about it now. Do not underestimate the importance and the impact of uh, emotional intelligence and being able to connect with people. You can always get into the tactics and strategy later but if you if you can't even connect with the person to begin with you're not going to have anything to talk about right so so always look for those connections when you can love it as patty sanchez says empathy is the key to leading organizational change totally agree uh, we'll open up in a second to questions from all of you so if you have a question you can head back we have a microphone there you can line up and we'll get to you in a second we'd love to hear the questions that you all have uh, so please head back and ask questions but in the meantime i will ask a question to the the panel which is in our class probably my favorite assignment is we do something called the change maker of the week I want every student to leave the class having been introduced to 40, 50 different change makers from all walks of life to see how they've led positive change from where they are. Students have to make a case for why this person is a change maker and apply the concepts from class. So my question for each of you is who is a change maker that inspires you, famous or not, and why? There's so many good ones. It's hard to pick favorites. Um, Lately for me, I, in the last couple of years especially, I've been become really passionate, passionate about plant-based living. And there is a woman, I don't know if some of you have heard of her, uh, Miyoko Shinner. She recently made the Forbes 50 over 50. Um, and she is completely just changing the game in the plant-based food space. She actually founded a vegan creamery several years ago and is going toe-to-toe with the, with the bigger industry and um, getting... She's been doing this kind of work for, for decades now, but she's finally at a point where people are, are buying in and coming along and you can start to see the change better for the planet, for the animals, for health, for environment. Um, and she did something that I was never sure that I would see the effects of in my lifetime, or at least not for several decades, and it's through all that hard work and just believing in your mission and making those connections, and she's really inspiring to watch. I have one that maybe is not as obvious, but does anyone know the podcast Dak Shepard, Armchair Expert? Yes. Okay. So Dak Shepard is a comedian actor, and um, he's also married to Kristen. 
Bell, yes. And I think that he's a change maker that inspires me because he very openly talks about vulnerability and especially being you know, a typical six foot four guy and he has like lots of tattoos and he's really built and all these stereotypes like you would never think that would be so vulnerable. I think that he's doing so much for people who look like him, people who sound like him, people who dress like him, all those things because he always talks very deep into like very emotional, vulnerable moments. Even I'm like, ooh, that was a little too honest. But I think it's been really enjoyable for me to listen and I feel like he's doing a lot for especially men and emotional intelligence so that just came to mind because I love his podcast and I heard he thinks UC Berkeley is the best school so like if he ever sees this clip then maybe he can come but I've been really enjoying the way he talks to his guests with experts and other celebrities too. Mine is a little more um close to home, but I'd say my parents are some of the biggest change makers that I have drawn from. Um, you know, they were kind of the people that pushed me to go beyond my comfort zone and the safety net of being in the UK. And I'd never lived away from home or anything like that and kind of pushed me to just go and see what was out there in America. And I had no idea what I was getting myself into, but they were very much like, you know, any chances you don't take are those that are missed, you know, and you're going to fail, you're going to do things um, that you maybe wish you hadn't and things like that, but do it. And that's kind of the legacy my mum and dad have lived by. And so, you know, looking at them as change makers and people who have provided for me and allowed me to kind of flourish in another country, even though it is so far away from home, um, is something that I'm grateful for. And I, you know, I, again, like didn't really view people like that as change makers before this, but they have made such an impact on me and become such a powerful like relationship now because of that. I love that. I appreciate the wide variety of different change makers that you all highlighted. So to quote, out, quote Brene Brown again, she says, vulnerability is courage in you. Uh, but weakness in myself, or we often think that way. And so I really appreciate that someone is courageous enough to ask the first question. So please just share your name and your affiliation with Haas, and then let's get to your question. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Julius. I'm an exchange student from Germany. Um, and I recently became involved with the effective altruism movement. Um, and I wanted to know yeah, what your thoughts are on how they actually try to like do research and identify the most pressing issues for a society. And if you think this is an effective way to make change, or if you have maybe not even heard of the movement, then I'd be happy to elaborate, but wanted to know what your thoughts are. Would you mind elaborating? Uh, I, I, I can take just, just real okay. quickly. I guess this is the faculty member question to, to answer. So, I mean, I think it's really interesting the lens they're taking. So, first of all, they're questioning the status quo. They're saying, how can we do the most good in the limited amount of time we have on Earth? So, I think that's a really powerful frame. I think an important aspect that should be raised up in the work that they do, perhaps, is the idea of empathy. So, sometimes they go in a very calculated way. And I think there's a role to think about. Well, also, what are the human stories as well? There's, I think, both quantitative and qualitative that could be important. I think they go more on the quantitative side. So that could be an interesting way to balance it out. But I think we need more people that are questioning the status quo because traditional philanthropy and other efforts aren't bringing about the systemic change that we need. So I think it's healthy to be questioning that. That's my perspective. Thank you so much. Thanks. Hi, I'm Laura Hasner. Full disclosure, I have the pleasure of teaching with Alex and the Berkeley Changemaker, but I promise he doesn't know I'm asking this question. <laughs> um, this is a question that our students have asked me to ask you for a very long time, and that is, what is your single best piece of advice for our changemakers? Oh. <laughs> Um, I think I hacked this question because I created a 15-week class with all my best advice, and so I think I lean into having 30 hours <laughs> Read the book. of it. Uh, um, I think my single biggest piece of advice is to stop waiting for permission and to give it to yourself. I think we can so often wait for someone else to tell us that, okay, you're ready. You can go be a leader. You can go be a change maker. And if you keep waiting and waiting and waiting, you'll find that that probably doesn't happen. And so it's very scary to put yourself out there. But I think the most powerful thing that begins the unlocking of your own change maker journey, and I hope that for many of you, it might happen like literally right this moment in this room, is to say, yeah, I can do something about this. I don't have to be the heropreneur, as Shannon said, um, but there's ways I can lead change in a way that's true to who I am. 
And it all starts with giving yourself that permission. So this is my invitation to each of you to take that invitation and to give yourself permission and to start leading change. So thank you, Laura, for that question. I and love build, that and advice so much. We're so proud of you. Congratulations. And building on that really quick, if you are someone, you if you know you have perfectionist tendencies, right, and you're just like, oh, I'm just going to wait for that little extra bit before I start, or it just, it doesn't feel right, right? Like, try to notice when that's happening and, 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 and pause that thinking and just start. Because if you, if you wait until you're ready, it's kind of like having a kid, right? What they say, if you, if you wait until you're ready, you'll just never have kids, right? So if, if, you're, if you wait until you really feel like you're ready, you're probably never going to feel fully ready. So just dive in and learn as you go and iterate, and it's a process. To add to that, the best advice I got as a content creator is done is best, right? Putting it out there is the best thing you could do, and everything after that is secondary. So done is best. I'm trying to also remind myself. It reminds me quite a bit of the nerves I felt on the first day of teaching becoming a change maker. So I'm a brand new faculty member. And you often hear about what it's like to be a student on the first day, but not often from the faculty side. And so I was teaching in N440 and had no idea what to expect. And so I um, uh, walked up the stairs and walked into the classroom, kind of took a deep breath, opened up the door and at that moment, what I saw nearly brought me to tears. So I saw that not only was every single seat taken, but there were students literally sitting in the side of the room on the windowsills, like so many people that were hungry for this class. And if I just kept waiting for the class to be perfect, there's never a time a class is perfect because there's so much that I didn't know in, at the time. I tried to lead into the value of students always and sort of say, look, look, we're going to learn all this together as we go, but to at least just have that sort of confidence without attitude to say, hey, maybe this is something that can be of value and let me give it a shot because there's never a time that you're perfect. So yeah, thanks for that. Do you have a question? Hi, I'm Kay Dawson with the Career Management Group. Hi, Shannon, welcome back. Um, thank you all of you for being here. Alicia, go to UG. Um, it's a big week for Brits. Uh, some of you may have heard in the news, um, we have a new king. Uh, the queen who's been in charge of my entire life um, passed away last week. So there's been a lot of calls for the monarchy to change. I want to ask all four of you, which piece of the book would you underline and present to King Charles? And what should he be doing as a future change maker in the public eye? Maybe questioning the status quo was the obvious one, but... I'll just leave it at that. I think for me, I would say lead with compassion and vulnerability. I think the monarchy is this very staunch British um, entity and particularly Charles, you know, he hasn't really had to do a whole lot under the Queen and, you know, everyone's kind of looking to William. And I think if we can get that impassioned leader that everyone, you know, I guess was looking at Diana for, if he can embody that, then I think that might be the monarchy revived. So I would underline the sections of, you know, how to lead with that compassion and vulnerability. I default to the native Brit. <laughs> <laughs> My advice is to be a network-based leader. So again, we tend to put the single leader up on a pedestal and look to them for all of the answers. And I think that's more and more an outdated concept. And so, of course, being a king, it comes with about as much formal authority as you can get. But to think about how can I be a node, not just a hub? How can I empower those around me to also be part of the efforts? Um, to think a bit about how do I not just shift power, but share power so that other people are part of it. Now, um, I don't know if he'd be interested in all of my advice there, but that's what I would like to see him, him do. Thanks for that question. Hi, I'm Nelly. I'm a third year Haas undergrad student. Um, I was wondering, in regards to the discussion of ungatekeeping success, how do you all believe that Haas and other business schools or companies can encourage slash incentivize collaboration among students rather than competition? I'm super passionate about this question. I heard that the Haas curve is dropped, right? Yes. So, yeah, that's, I didn't have that, but I think that's... That's a. I think that's a huge step Change into the right. Change making an action. Yeah, that's a huge step into the right direction. I don't know, but higher powers here made that happen. And I'm so happy for the Haas students. Um, I think another thing. So that's a good one. And then I think when it comes to community and like a lot of 
opportunities, especially around career. There's, I know we have so many very competitive clubs here, all that which I've got rejected to actually. And I don't know, I think there's just a way we can open up a conversation of like abundance mindset of like, maybe we don't need to be admitting one person to a consulting club a semester, right? Like maybe we can open it up to five, right? And um, just opening the conversation about like the more people you have in organizations or groups or clubs, these people are going to be doing cool, amazing things afterwards that they're going to probably want to give back to. So the more people you can get involved, like the better it is going to be for everyone. So hopefully when it comes to clubs and uh, recreational things here, I want to encourage students and faculty or whoever is listening to, um, maybe we can encourage to open up some seats and opportunities. I know sometimes it's a logistics thing, but I think that's a big part of um, something that we can actually improve is like opening up spots. (laughs) I think for me, uh, in another class actually, we also talked about collaboration and the importance of, you know, that conflict that's task oriented and the diversity and bringing as many people together to get these experiences. And then we would take the final exam or we do all the projects on our own and the importance of collaboration. But as an individual, we would take the exam or we would take the project. And I would have loved to take some more things as a group and learn from those students that we'd had those discussions with and things like that. And the importance of, you know, doing an end of year group project like we did. Um, Like it was like so important to me that I got to speak to those people, but I would have loved to work with them in my leadership class and stuff like that. Yeah, I think building on that idea, um, there's a really good analogy here, I think, when you talk about the process of creating the defining principles through Haas, right? And the and the four, the Rich Lions went through this whole process to get these four defining principles up. And it's one thing to just create them and then stick them on the wall or stick them in the courtyard and then walk away and then just expect people to start implementing them, right? But if you really want those things to be embedded in your culture, you need to change fundamental processes, right? You need to figure out how you can weave you know, what you value or what you say is important into processes, into everything you do. So if you say collaboration is important, but you're still rewarding individual merit and individual talents and, you know, maybe the loudest person in the room, that's a fundamental um, break from what you say you value, right? So however you can embed collaboration into day-to-day activities in terms of evaluations, in terms of of clubs, like you said, um, that'll, that'll change over time if you can get there. Great question. Thank you. Got time for one more question. Uh, hi, my name is Ryusei. I'm a sophomore here at, at Berkeley. Uh, probably getting into Haas, I don't know yet. <laughs> it depends. Um, uh, and the question that I wanted to ask was for all four of you, because I think it's very interesting. So every time I uh, hire someone from, for my startup, I ask them this question. What do you think differentiates a good leader from a great leader? I'd love to hear what you guys think. Trevor question, I'll go last. There's so many things, but the first, you know, again, going with my first instinct, humility, right? You do not, it's funny, you, you don't think of the person leading change as being the first one to say, I don't know everything, but when you're in that space of being honest with yourself and others that you don't know everything, you're open. You're, you open yourself up to learning more. Um, you don't make assumptions. You, you you are constantly a student of the world and student a student of the areas you wish to change. And I think that humility also create safe spaces for other people to come to you with their, their thoughts and suggestions. You know, would you, would you rather go to someone with your thoughts if they think they you might actually make an impact and they'd hear you, or would you rather go to someone who you figure is not going to listen to you because they already know it all, right? So um, I would say start with humility and lots of good things follow from there. I'd say, obviously, humility would probably be my top one. But I think the second most important for me is the ability to listen to listen and not necessarily to talk. And I feel like in this society, we everybody wants to get a word. And, you know, like we all love the sound of our voices and stuff like that and listening to ourselves talk. But having that leader that knows when to step back and to listen purely to hear people and understand them is, you know, definitely what makes me feel most valued. And I think sometimes, and I get into this, you know, I have three sisters, so we all want to just talk at each other and not necessarily listen. And I feel like 
being able to hear each other out is one of the most powerful things. And I think that is something pretty rare in a great leader and is what makes them great and not necessarily good. Very similar to what everyone has just said, but for me, the biggest thing I, like I'm, I'm at my new grad job, I'm only a year in, but quickly I can already sense that's a good leader, that's not a good leader, you know? And the big common theme for me is really empathy leadership. I think the work is the work and I think a lot of people can do good work, but a really good leader is someone that you feel safe with to talk to and um, just kindness, I think, like that trust thing is such a big thing for me. And what I'm seeing, especially big successful organizations, there's a lot of talented people. There's a lot of smart people and the leaders that really stick out to you and the, the leaders you want to follow to their next job or you would go anywhere with, or you would really want to like actively spend time with are people who are really empathy driven leadership. And it's not always in the obvious way of like people with the highest ranking or maybe they make more money than you or all these things. It's really, they could be maybe the same quote unquote role as you, but they could be a leader to you because they take time to listen and really be developing that those empathy skills. Um, that's the biggest thing that is like a way I'm like, that's a good leader and that's a bad leader is those types of skills. I'm really passionate about inclusive leadership. I have a whole chapter dedicated to it, an entire week of the class dedicated to it. Um, and Juliet Bork and Andrea Espedito have done amazing research on what makes a leader inclusive. What they find is that there's sort of two superpowers when combined leads to increased feelings of inclusion, exponentially so. And so that's humility. So I completely agree, being grounded in humility. The second is an awareness of our biases. When you have both humility and an awareness of our bias, that's where feelings of inclusion skyrocket. And so that's why I look for in a leader to truly be inclusive is both of those. Um, okay, as we wrap up, just a couple of announcements. The first is that um, we will be selling books in the back, and I'm very happy to sign books if anyone would like one. Uh, and we also have 10 copies of the book to give away for free. So if you look underneath your seat, if you have a post-it note, you win a free book. So, so if, if you're one of the lucky winners of the post-it note, go see Sarah in the back to pick up your ticket. All right, so with that, let me say thank you so much for being part of this book launch celebration. The world has never been more ready for you, and thank you for being here. Thanks, everyone.